Okay, let me uh, move this back a little bit. Okay, because we, <laughs> because we, um, because last week we missed, and this coming Monday is Shavuos, I'm going to really try to really get some things accomplished tonight. Let's see if we can get through some Mishnayas quickly in Pirkei Avos. Okay, uh, we're going to start with chapter 5, because last Shabbos was chapter 5, next Shabbos is chapter 6. Um, Mishnah 1. Ba'asara maimaras nivara ha'olam. The world was created with ten statements. Asara maimaras, okay? What were these ten statements? Okay, so um, everyone that said that God said, okay, when you look at the Chumash, you'll see. However, when you count them, you see that there are only nine. So one appears to be missing. That one really is a hidden one, and it's the first one, um, uh, Bracious Bara, uh, in the beginning, Hashem created. Okay, so even though it doesn't say Hashem said, it does say Hashem created. Um, it does say he created. And the reason why that is considered a hidden or concealed statement is because it doesn't directly say said. So what is going on with that concealed statement? So the Mishnah continues. It asks us, what does this teach us, these 10 statements? I mean, that the world was created with 10 statements. Because truthfully, everything could have been created with one statement. The reason why there's 10 utterances or statements is to punish the wicked who destroy the world and to give a good reward to the righteous who sustain the world. So let's discuss this, okay? So the concealed statement that I spoke about, the one where it doesn't overtly say Hashem said, is there, and that statement sustains and puts life force into the negative stuff in this world. Why? So we have to understand that Hashem created and is continuously creating or sustaining every aspect of creation, even the wicked, even the, the, our enemies who want to destroy us, God forbid, and wipe us out. This is very foreign, a foreign concept to the West, who has a, which has a dualistic view of how the world operates. Good and evil are completely separate. Now, even though we understand that Hashem is totally good, we also have to take it on faith, it's impossible to intellectually totally grasp this, that, um, that evil is also sustained by God, and it's in the service of good. What do I mean by this? So, Sometimes, not sometimes, always, when we see and experience negative situations, whether from without, outside our lives, politics, wars, God forbid, things like that, or personal situations, we think that these things that are happening are bad. And at one level, they are bad. For sure they're bad. But at another level, they are in the service of good because the negative is there for a couple of purposes. The main purpose is for Bechira, for free will. We get to choose evil or good. The other is, which is related, is it tests us. It tests our faith. We have a choice when we're suffering and when we see evil. Our choice is, is to say there's evil in the world, Hashem doesn't care, or he's not involved with us, or something along those lines, or we can say there's evil in the world and my job is to, number one, choose good, and my other job is to still have faith in Hashem 
that whatever is going on is ultimately at the deepest level for the good. And the reason why it's concealed in the opening, that, that first statement is not overtly said, that first utterance, gracious bara and Hashem created in the beginning and Hashem created, right? Why that isn't overtly said is so it gives us this lesson and this idea that there are some things that are concealed from us and that Hashem has still created them anyway. This is a lesson that, um, this is a lesson that we have to take to heart as Jews because the whole rest of the world sees evil as separate. Okay, either they have uh, um, many deities or they have two or three deities with opposing forces. Okay, all right. Um, questions? Nothing. No. By the way, guys, I am so jet lagged. I'm really hoping I can get through this class tonight. <laughs> My head's swimming, so we'll hang it. We'll try to hang in there. Okay. Um, everything that was created with these utterances, these ten utterances. Okay. Was hidden prior to the Torah's revelation at Sinai. And we know in just a few days, we're going to experience or re-experience Matan Torah, the giving of the Torah at Sinai. Okay. So what were the Jews doing up until that point? If things were hidden from us, and they were, and we didn't get the Torah, things were concealed. Okay. Even the good things were concealed. What were we doing? How were we keeping the Torah? We know that Abraham Avinu, our, our father, Abraham, he kept the Torah. How did he do that? So he was able to do that because of his deep spiritual connection and abiding love for Hashem. And through this connection, he was able to deduce, some of the commentaries say, what the laws of Torah were. This is really fascinating. That must be a very great love for Hashem, because we know keeping the Torah means following the laws. So he had to investigate and think about what these laws were in order to keep them. Now, later on, when we get the Torah, we have an easy choice. We can choose to follow it, or we can choose to not follow it. Or we can do something in between, which many people do, because we're all at different points in our spiritual development. But Avraham Avinu rose above that. Avraham's love for Hashem was so great that he actually kept the Torah, even though it wasn't necessarily incumbent upon him to keep the Torah. And he taught Torah in some kind of rudimentary format, because we know that he was the first convert, right? He was the first Jew. And we know that many people came to his and Sarah's ohel, to their tent. And they gave them Torah, Sarah to the women and Abraham Avinu to the men. That's a very great love. When you love Hashem so much that even in your confusion, and even when things are hidden for you, you will take the time, the energy, your resources to really find out what Hashem wants, even in the midst of confusion. This is a lesson for us today because we all come from Abraham Avinu. We all come from Abraham. Okay? And we all go through periods where the Torah doesn't necessarily feel so revealed to us. It, as a matter of fact, it it feels concealed in a way. And in order to tap into, okay, our relationship with Hashem and with his Torah, we have to reflect, think about, and act on our best instincts. Okay, what are our best instincts? The part inside us that yearns to be close to Hashem. Now, it's easy for me to say this, and it's hard for me and you to do this. It's very easy to say this. 
So how do we get there? Okay, so Rebbe Nachman teaches us something. He teaches us what we talked about last semester. He teaches us Aye, Aye Makom Kavode. Where is the place of Hashem's Kavod, His glory and honor, His spectacularness? Okay, where is that place? That place, this is what's so amazing is hidden in the very beginnings of creation. It's hidden in that first concealed statement where Bresh's bara, and, and in the beginning, okay, Hashem created. He didn't say it, he just created. We know that that statement, that utterance is concealed. Just as we know that the place of Hashem's kavod is also concealed. And it's hidden where? In that first state. In our very beginnings, in our roots, if you will. So, excuse me, one moment. So, when we get in touch with our own personal roots, okay, our own personal connection to the Torah, we don't think Torah is for someone else. We, we know it's for us. We know it's for us. We believe that. When we do that, we wipe away the confusion. We, we wipe away the concealment. And we expose the glory of Hashem and the fact that he gave the Torah to us. He gave it to me. He gave it to you. So thinking about this is one thing. Talking about it is another. Putting it to practice requires more than that. What does it require? It requires when you hear a Torah lesson that makes you think, okay? This may not be the most inspiring concepts, but they do make you think, okay? So what can you do with that information? Jot it down, make a note of it so you don't forget it. Write down your questions. And tomorrow, when you're davening, when you make his bodhis, when you talk to Hashem, give yourself two or three minutes to discuss this with him. This is what Rebbe Nachman's instructions are to us. Take your confusion, take your doubts, take, your, your, take the places where boundaries are obscured for you, and don't just listen to a class or read a book. Go talk to God about this. This is how you put this into practice. So it doesn't just stay up here, but so that it moves into the heart and it affects how you live in this world. Um, so Simcha Yael and I were just in Uman. We had an amazing trip there. It was very intense. It was physically <laughs> really grueling. This time, this time was a very difficult trip. It was also, for me, the most rewarding trip to Oman ever. Meanwhile, the suffering, there was like physical discomfort. There was, everything that could go wrong, wrong just about did from pothole roll, roads to delayed buses, our flight home was delayed seven hours, but just one thing after the other after the other. Nothing nothing flowed in the physical, the gashmiistic realm. But in the spiritual realm, a lot was going on. IA was going on. Things were obscure, they were concealed, they were hidden from us. And a thousand times a day, just as I was about to lose it, I kept trying to tell myself, Aye Makam Kavoda. In the place of this confusion is going to lie or lies and will be revealed Hashem's greatest covenant. And it was. The experience was unbelievable. I knew even as I was sick, I was sick. I was like sick to my stomach the whole time. Simchael was similarly not feeling so great. 
even as we knew we were going through a hard time, a deep, deep, serious, difficult struggle, at the same time, because we're grass lovers, we also knew that there's a reason for it and that something, there's something was there, okay? But guys, you don't just have to live that way in Oman. You can do that in California, New York, Denver, Wyoming, Kentucky, Brooklyn, Lakewood. You can do that wherever you live. When things are obscure for you, when, when boundaries are blurred, when, there, when confusion reigns, and when Hashem's statements, his utterances are concealed, look. Look for Hashem in that confusion. He's in that confusion. He's concealed, but he's in there. And there's a way through. The way through really truly begins with prayer. Okay? It begins with prayer. Even if it's a thousand times a day. Even if it's just a minute at a time. Because that's the thing that's going to keep you real. That's going to keep you authentic. Because that's just between you and Hashem. Okay. Okay, questions, questions, questions so far. No, okay. So I do want to, I don't want to belabor this, but I want to say one more thing based on what Reb Nussin says and, and what Rebbe Nachman also says. Um, this also, this concealment that we spoke about also refers to those times where you yourself have made a wrong move. We've all made wrong moves. Okay, we've we've all made transgressions. Those times, during those times, and after those times, when you have remorse for them or regret or confusion about them, even in those things, you can look for Hashem. Because remember, at the deepest, deepest level, if it happened, it was the rat zone. Hashem, the will of God. And there comes a point where we all have to take responsibility for our actions. We should do tshuva, which is another class. We should do tshuva, for sure. But at the deepest level, Hashem is still there. Even if he appears concealed to us, he's still there. And those missteps we made Ultimately, Hashem was even there with us during those mistakes. And that can be very comforting. Okay? That can be very comforting. It's very comforting to me to know that I'm not alone even when I'm even when I'm going down and, and, and really struggling to hang on and do the right thing. Even there, if I remind myself Hashem is with me, the truth is I usually am able to pick myself right up take a step back or a step forward, whatever the case may be. Okay. okay. We're going to move on from this Mishnah. And we're going to move on to, okay. Don't you love Pirkei Avos? I love it. It's so great. But I only love it with Rebbe Nachman's commentaries. Otherwise, I mean, I like it anyway. Of course, it's Torah. It's beautiful. But it just makes it so much richer. Okay. Um, so we're going to actually go to Mishnah 2. Asara doros me'adam va'ad noach lahodia kama erech apayim lefana. Okay. So there were 10 doros, 10 generations from Adam, okay, Adam Arishon to Noah. Okay. Why? Because these ten generations were there to show us Hashem's erech apayim, his, his patience, his ability to, to step back, so to speak, okay, and give us chance after chance after chance to make corrections. Um, now, all those generations angered Hashem. And at some point, he brought about the marble, the flood. There were also 
10 generations from Noah to Abraham. And also to show the greatness of Hashem's ability to be patient with us. And those generations also continually angered him until Abraham came and he was the one who received the reward. Okay. So let's talk about this. Um, Hashem it wants us to choose. He doesn't want us to be robots. So he gives us opportunity after opportunity to make corrections in our life. And if we look at our lives and we reflect upon them, okay, we reflect upon the past areas of our lives and our present, we can see that we've made choices that aren't always the most positive choices. And sometimes we've done them again and again and again and again and again. And I don't mean necessarily just actions that are wrong. I also mean little choices such as um, not speaking truthfully. If you could think about how many times you weren't quite authentic or quite true, okay? There was a, a part of you that wanted to manipulate a situation. Why am I bringing this up? Because sometimes people think of, when we say transgressions, they think of them as these big, terrible, you know, immoral sins. But there are many little, little things that, um, that are not really the way a person should, should carry themselves through life. Or the times, for example, that our behavior was, let's say, narcissistic. Or the times where we were unkind. Or the times where we rolled our eyes when someone walked in the room. These are the things. These are the things that we're capable of correcting. Now, the generations of the flood obviously were horrendous. It was a lot worse. But we also, even with these little tiny things, have done them over and over and over again our whole lives. And we don't get punished for them, so to speak. We don't get we don't get retribution. You're not allowed to lie. You told a lie. Bam. You know you're you're going to lose something. God forbid. No. Hashem steps back. He doesn't necessarily give us too many rewards and certainly not many punishments in this world. Why? Because we he wants us to choose. He wants us to look inside ourselves and make a choice. Because if you hold you know, a, a gun at someone's head and say, choose, they're going to choose what you want. They're not going to change inside. When you're raising a child, the threat of punishment will get you the behavior you want very often, but it won't get you an internal change inside the child. It works for adults, too. Okay? Sometimes, like in the army, the behavior may be more important than the personal growth. You've got a war to fight, you have to have behavior that's going to keep people safe and take out the enemy. I mean, what do I know? I don't know about the war, but that's what I imagine. But in our lives, in order to grow, that has to come from us either logically, mentally weighing the consequences and the options, or from us listening to our hearts and combining that feeling in our hearts with our logic so that we reach the point where the choices we're making are good, not only for um, our personal instant gratification, but also good for our long term. What's good for our long term? Our connection with Hashem. Absolutely. Because that connection is eternal, forever and ever and ever. Okay? So, if Hashem, you know, tied her hands and said, choose, you can either do the right thing and you're free, or you do the wrong thing, I'm going to keep your hands tied all the time, you're not free. Okay, that's really not much of a service. That's an enslavement. But Hashem doesn't do that. Now, I do want to talk about situations 
where Hashem may tie one hand behind our back, or we may have um, some suffering, okay? However, the suffering that we have in this life is never the suffering that strict justice would require. And when we think about it, even people who suffer a lot, not that I want to hear anybody suffers, but when we think about it, we come to understand that the challenges, pain, hardship, suffering in our lives are ultimately there to help guide us, not to hurt us. It's different than a punishment. It's really different. Okay? If we believe this, if we believe that the hard times that we go through, the challenges, the, the things we lack in our lives, and so on and so forth, if we believe that they're really there to help us, we begin to be able to look through, okay, whatever's going on, and extract the lesson from the situation. And I'm not just talking difficult per interpersonal situations and so on and so forth. I'm even talking physical situations, okay? You often hear of people who face tremendous difficulties, okay, who we're able to overcome them spiritually and grow from them. So I'm going to give you two examples. There's a man, uh, I don't know his name, but I'm sure you've all, you know, you've seen a video of him or heard about him. He's a man who was born without uh, legs and arms. And he trained himself to do all kinds of physical feats. He didn't let this situation, these disabilities bother him. I think he's Australian. Does anybody know who I mean? He's, he's like very popular. He's a motivational speaker and so on and so forth. Yes, or some knows. Okay. So um, this is certainly something to be respected. It's not a doubt in it. Okay, Marianne's heard of him too. He could give in. He could have give, given in and said, I'm, I have nothing. You know, I can't get around in this world. And that's it. I'm just a mind trapped in a deformed body. And I give him, I give him a lot of respect. However, okay, however, the Jewish approach, the Torah approach, might not be, not criticizing him, by the way, but it might not be to do and to achieve in the realm where you have the greatest lack. Think about it. The Torah approach might be, wow, there's no arms and legs here. Maybe I'm supposed to develop my mind and heart. Again, this isn't a criticism of him because I think he inspires a lot of people. There's a man named Dr. Muhammad Cohen, and he has an uh, ALS, which is a disease that destroys the nervous system, the breathing apparatus, and so on and so forth. At this point, last I heard, if I'm, I'm not mistaken, he lives in Eretz Yisrael. Last I heard he was able to breathe through some kind of machine. He's virtually he's, he's paralyzed, but he can blink his eyes. And he painstakingly answers hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of letters every month by blinking an eye at a special computer and typing one letter at a time by, with the blink of an eye. Okay. I don't know who Rabbi Yitzi, Marianne asked Rabbi Yitzi, I don't know who that is. His name is, um, um, uh, he's, he's a, a, a um, Malamed Cohen, Dr. Malamed Cohen. He's a doctor. And he's a rabbi too. 
I'm going to get you the information about him. So he also writes beautiful poetry, again, with these eye blinks. And he's also an artist. Again, he has a graphic program in his computer where he does this kind of cabalistic, very beautiful art. Now, the letters that he answers are letters from people who are going through difficult challenges in their lives. And, and it's true, sometimes their challenges are really serious. But they write to him because he's cracked the code. He's totally cracked the code. He understands that his suffering, and the man is suffering on the one hand, but his suffering has taught him, and he said he wouldn't trade it. It's taught me every okay, everything he knows. So Michal says Rabbi Yitzi Hurwitz has ALS and writes Dev Torah with his eyes. He's in LA. I don't know him. This is a different, this is a different person. Okay, so there's another one. Okay, so here's another one. So I'm going to have to look him up. Rabbi Yitzi Horowitz has ALS. Okay. And what's he doing? He's writing Divrei Torah. He's talking about God to people, which is what Rabbi Nachman tells us to do. He tells us we should talk to each other about Hashem. Okay. They're not taking their lack and trying to correct the lack. They're taking their lack as an instruction for, I should be concentrating on something else. Okay? And by the way, again, I'm not knocking that first person at all. I really actually admire that quite a bit. Okay? So when, whenever we have, each of us has a lack in our lives. We may lack something materially. We may lack something physically. We may lack something intellectually. We may lack a certain type of relationship. We may lack money. We may lack a physical ability, and so on and so forth. Okay, we may lack time. Okay, whatever that lack is, the lesson may not be to push through till we get what we lack. It may not be the lesson. The lesson may be to emulate Hashem's erech his patience, and to sit back and to look at the situation and to figure out what we should be doing to develop ourselves given the situation we're in. Does everybody understand that, what I'm trying to say? I'm so tired from jet lag, but I really want to be clear because it's such an important lesson. Yes. Good. Teresa, th hi, Teresa. Teresa thinks so. Okay, Sandy has a big yes. Okay, Barakash, Mary Annex. Okay, so Teresa, if you have, you know, if I can elaborate, let me know. Okay, but you could go back, scroll back, and later, and just listen to that, those few sentences again, because everybody, including you, has situations that are that appeal to, appear to us as not being ideal. They're not ideal. Who has the perfect life? Right. So that's why I said, Teresa, I was thinking of your situation too. Okay. I, I know you're I'm thinking of your situation. I'm thinking about you. We all have situations that don't look ideal. How can we how can we be have the peace of mind to even serve Hashem with all the flack we're facing? Well, we know Abraham Bavinu did. Remember, he had 10 tests. Okay. He had 10 big tests. And we know that these 10 generations, the one from Adam to Noah and the other 10 from Noah to Abraham of Inu, they didn't do that. They didn't do that. They, there was no growth, which is why Hashem sent the flood the first time. Because what is iniquity? What is iniquity? What is that turning away from Hashem? Okay. So iniquity, really, is just cutting off a part of ourselves, the best part of ourselves. That's all. Okay? We don't have to beat ourselves up for the past. We just have to move forward in the future. Of course, we have to correct some things, but that's a whole other topic. Okay. Um, Rebbe Nachman says, 
in advice, there's a section in advice called savlanut or savlanus, patience. Okay. So Rebbe Nachman says that anyone who really seeks Hashem, who really, really, truly seeks Hashem, there are a lot of people who say they want Hashem. But he's talking about someone who seeks Hashem in truth has to believe and have to know it intellectually somehow and believe it more with faith that all the pain, grief, and hardship that they go through is actually reflecting Hashem's kindness. He's actually being patient with us. Instead of wiping us out, Instead of hitting us over the head with a, with a you know with a hammer, okay, he's giving us situations that squeeze us a little, so that we think, what's our natural response? Our natural response, our in our innate response is to kick. You know when you go to the doctor, I don't even know if they do this anymore. And they test your reflexes with a little rubber hammer. Do they still even do that? I don't think doctors spend more than thirty seconds with you today. They used to hit you in the knee with a little wooden, a uh, little rubber hammer to check your reflexes. Okay, and the knee hit with a little hammer. The knee automatically kicks. Most of us, okay, we have a hard situation and we kick against it. We fight against it. I don't have this. I don't like this. I don't want that person to do this. What do we do? We fight instead of. Savlan, Savlan is sitting back, emulating Hashem's patience, looking at the situation and saying, why am I going through this? What does it mean? How should I handle this? The Rebbe tells us that Hashem sends only as much pain as we can bear. It feels like pain and suffering, but really it's a squeeze to wake us up. He never sends us more than we can handle. He crushes it up to small bits so that we can go from there. Even if it feels like it's more than we can handle, it's really not. Um, He says to us, Rebbe Nachman tells us, we have to believe without a doubt that we have the ability to endure whatever it is we're going through. We have the ability to endure it. Sometimes enduring it might mean, and this is a lesson for me too, that we need to ask for help. This was a big lesson I learned on the Suman trip. I was enduring a lot of insanity. With, you know, the Ukrainian system I don't even want to go into too many details, but basically it's one giant mafia in that country, and you have to bribe people to get things done, and it's chaos sometimes. It was insane. And at the end of it, a good friend of mine on the trip who came on the first trip said to me, your problem is, is you don't ask for help. The light bulb went off. Okay? Sometimes when we're going through a hard situation, other things are required of us. And sometimes we just need to ask for help. Okay. Rebbe Nachman once said, and this is from our oral tradition, from our Masorah, that if a person refuses to accept that in life he must suffer a little, he's going to end up suffering a lot. Why? Because when Hashem sends us a situation that's sticky or difficult, even if it seems overwhelming to us, we have to believe that he is only sending it to us ultimately in order for us to grow and that he's not sending us the full force. Okay, he's holding back. He's withholding a lot of suffering. It's hard to believe when we're suffering, but it's the truth. Rabbeinu says it, and the bottom throughout the ages have said it. Okay, I see there's some questions. Or Simcha said, 
in each generation, there's 10. 10 generations, 10 songs, 10 songs. It's a natural progression. We need the progression in the tikkun. Just like the Baal HaTefila talks to people until he reaches talking to them about Hashem, God, we should perhaps build our mind and heart instead of, instead of jumping to fixing the lacking. Okay. So what I think you're saying, or Samcha, is you're reflecting first on the fact that this theme of 10 is there for us. There's also, remember, right, Asaras Hadibros, right, the, the, ten, uh, the 10 Commandments, right? Ultimately, that's what all of this is. The 10 spheros, okay, too. So the progression of working through all this suffering and all these difficulties is what Orisopha says. We should focus on what's in our mind and heart. We should develop our thoughts through prayer, through reflection, through discussing it with other people who can advise us instead of jumping to fix whatever the problem is, okay? Or Asimcha hit the nail on the head. We chase after solutions. I'll tell you, I, I have someone um, who's called me a few times recently, in the past few weeks, um, before I left and now. She's going through problems with, in her life, a difficult time. And she's going from doctor to doctor to teacher to rabbi to this to that. She's just jumping to fix. Instead of saying, what does Hashem want from me? I'm trying to get her to slow down. What does Hashem want from me? Let me think about this. Let me daven about this. Oh, that person might have the answer. Oh, that person might have the answer. Oh, I read that book. That might have the answer. Sometimes there isn't an actual answer. Sometimes the answer is the doing. The answer is in the doing. The prayer, the reflection thinking about it, the discussion, okay? I think I mentioned to you at the beginning of the semester that we're in Sphiris HaOmer. And in Sphiris HaOmer, we go through a roller coaster because every single day, okay, if you, by the way, I haven't counted yet. If you have, don't mention today's, okay, I haven't counted tonight's yet. But we go through all these different, um, these different spheros that we're correcting. Tikkunim are being done. And if you look, as Rabbi Nachman says, if you look at each day's happenings, news, events, and what you hear and see and experience that day, you'll see it's all about that day's sphere account. It's so amazing. I was thinking about this with this whole thing with the embassy and uh, the, the riots in Gaza and so on and so forth. And this also pertains to us personally. We've been through a hard time the past few weeks personally. Everybody has had a lot going on. I don't know anybody who's just kicked back. That's because of the Omer, okay? Now, in a few days, it's going to be Shavuos. So we know that all this jumping up and down and back and forth and Rita's and Aliyah's, okay, all these ups and downs are really a preparation to Matan Torah. When we have a suffering, a squeeze, a lack, it's only for the sake of receiving the Torah. It's true. It's only for the sake. Whatever you personally are going through in your life, okay, no that it's only for the sake of coming closer to Hashem. Okay. I think we're going to stop here, even though I have a lot more of, um, a lot more Pirkei Avos, because I cannot keep my eyes open. So I just want to, uh, you know, wrap up. If you have questions, please go right ahead. If not, I just want to wish you all a beautiful week. It was Rosh Chodesh just a few minutes ago. It's just about ended now. And it's Sivan. And we're going to have, um, God willing, a beautiful Shavuos. I wish each of you a beautiful Yantif. 
It should be sweet. It should be good. We should each feel like we've really accomplished and received the Torah. And um, I just want to encourage everybody, you know, just to connect to each other and uh, give each other some encouragement because I see that that's very important in our lives. All right. Good Yantif. Thank you. Chag Sameach. Be well, everybody.